My name is Mikhail Shcherbakov, and today I want uh, to tell you a few stories about Kibana bug bounty. Uh, this uh, first part of uh, the talk about uh, vulnerability that I found in Kibana, and I combine it only remote code execution uh, vulnerabilities in this talk, just because of time limits. A uh, few words about me. Um, now I'm finishing my PhD studies at KTH uh, University, Stockholm, and working on the thesis uh, Code Reuse Attacks in Managed Programming Languages and Runtimes. Uh, my main research interest is the static code analysis, uh, dynamic program analysis, and uh, uh, language-based security in general. I participated in bug bounty programs of Microsoft, GitHub, uh, some open source project, and Elastic. And today we'll talk about Elastic uh, bug bounty program, uh, namely uh, Kibana bug bounty program. Who is Kibana? Uh, Kibana is a part of popular uh, Ilka stack that uh, includes Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. Uh, it used for data visualization and uh, real-time analysis. So, uh, Kibana is open source project. Uh, all code is available and uh, it's uh, possible to analyze statically or just make a manual review. It's definitely a large project, probably one of the largest, is written in TypeScript. Uh, and they have an uh, interesting bug bounty program with uh, 3,000, 10,000 uh, rewards for uh, critical vulnerabilities. All of that makes Kibana is a great target for bug hunters. And I contribute the last year a lot uh, in this program. And before starting to uh, tell about vulnerabilities uh, in Kibana, I would like to say my thanks to Elastic Security team. Uh, in my practice, in my experience, it's one of the best uh, bug bounty programs that's uh, managed by Elastic Security team. Uh, thank you guys for your work. And uh, the main reason that I contribute uh, a lot in this bug bounty, it's just a good uh, uh, experience of this work. So story number one, uh, how it all began. One year ago, in the last August, uh, after DEFCON, I found that Elastic Bug Bounty started um, complaining for a new feature that's called Synthetic Monitoring uh, in the Kibana uh, product in, uh, um, that can be used for some uh, dashboard. The idea of the feature that you can set up some monitors uh, for websites and see how the website is available or some content was changed and make some reports based on uh, such monitoring. Okay, uh, let's see uh, how this um, feature looks like in practice. This uh, main page of the Kibana, you can find uh, synthetics, the feature that we discussed, you can create new monitor to monitor some website. Uh, you need to set a name of the monitor, location when your agent will be run uh, to make a request to the site. And look, you can define some script. So it looks interesting. Uh, we have a, some script editor and we can paste own script here. Let's check the documentation, how such scripts uh, look like. Uh, it's one of the examples, the simple script that's just uh, open the example.org and uh, check um, some element, the text and the element, and check that it equals uh, to example domain. Okay. But it looks like a JavaScript, right? So if we just replace the body of this uh, method and uh, write, for example, uh, to run a reverse shell, probably we can execute it. 
But exactly this uh, code does not work uh, because of require. Uh, if you did some JavaScript CTF, you probably already know about this problem. You don't have a require in the scope, but you can bypass it for Node.js, for example. You can use uh, load underscore load uh, method in the uh, process main module to load any uh, um, module, including child process, and you can run uh, reverse shell. Let's see on the demo. We uh, uh, paste this code, uh, click on the run, and see you have uh, already a connection from the reverse shell, from the agent. We see uh, the file system and the user on this agent, on the Herbit engine. Um, you can see the Herbit name of the user uh, uh, that we get uh, that monitor any websites. Okay? This remote code execution, I think is the simplest remote code execution that I reported. And in the last August, I made report uh, the program, um, the company, uh, company uh, already finishing and it was the last days uh, and also the rules for the post exploitation was not clear and I decided, okay, I found it, I will report it and uh, let, let's see. We discussed this report with Elastic uh, security team in September and in October they uh, came back with the feedback. Uh, synthetics by design is arbitrary code execution as a service in which Elastic deploys a number of security features to prevent exploitation. For successful exploit, someone would have to do something beyond getting a shell. Okay. So it makes sense if you make such feature, probably you already isolated uh, uh, this code on the container. Uh, and they, what they actually did. Uh, okay, we, we discussed it and uh, I decided to continue exploitation of this container and see what uh, I can get uh, in the end. Where we are? Uh, this is an isolated container. After some investigation, I see that it's run in the Kubernetes cluster on Google Cloud Platform. Uh, probably uh, it was managed Kubernetes cluster, but it does not. Uh, the details uh, is not important here. Uh, the first idea was try to affect another clients on the same container, but the container was uh, running per task. So uh, we don't have any persistent state after the execution of the code that we injected, uh, the container just restarted and no any client there. Okay, try to escape the container. It was secure configuration of up-to-date Kubernetes version. So it looks like um, no, no possible. Access to Google Cloud Platform Metadata API no, again. So I think it's one of the first uh, thing that they check. It looks like unexploitable case. So we found remote code execution, but we cannot uh, bypass the container isolation. Uh, I continue investigated uh, some things around and found the same Docker container for private Kubernetes cluster. It means we can run it in the own Kubernetes cluster. It makes um, threat model a little bit weak because we don't have exactly the same settings. We can say if we can uh, escape from container or affect some other services or features, uh, in the default configuration on the Kubernetes, uh, it looks like a possible uh, exploitation flow. And I also uh, found that this container already have natural capabilities. It means that we can send any raw package to the network. Any package. It means we can emulate any protocol. For example, we can say send our 
packages. I think you already understand my idea and uh, get what I want to do. Yeah, let's try to do ARP spoofing attack in 2024. So, our protocol allows to send some request to match IP address to the MAC address of any computer. And for example, in the network, when Bob tried to connect to Mary and communicate by IP uh, transport, we can say to Bob that Mary is an attacker computer and say to Mary the Bob is an attacker computer and intercept the traffic between these two machines. It's a simple, uh, old, very old, old school uh, attack. Uh, but what about Kubernetes? Um, I already wanted to start to run Wireshark and investigate the traffic, what actually happens, and found a nice blog post uh, from near Chaco, attacking Kubernetes clusters throws your network plumbing. So, uh, he described the same idea of ARP spoofing uh, to uh, uh, replace DNS server that available in the Kubernetes to the own uh, DNS server. And in this case, you can uh, hijack any DNS request and uh, uh, show on uh, uh, send a request uh, to the own web server instead of any available web server. And the crucial component of this attack, uh, this is uh, this bridge that's called BR0 on this figure. So this bridge uh, supports ARP protocol and has own ARP uh, table uh, that uh, has any IP addresses and MAC addresses of the pods that run on the same node. So it looks like very restricted attack. We can affect only pods on the same node. Uh, but default uh, network interface in Kubernetes allows us to uh, exploit ARP spoofing. Let's see on the demo. So the one of the idea to start uh, this attack was to use some uh, cloud environment. I check Microsoft Azure and they allow us to use default Kubernetes. So you can see the console. Uh, I already started attacker at victim pods. Uh, uh, and you can see that it's run on the same node in Kubernetes cluster. It allows us to uh, perform attack from the attacker to affect the victim. Uh, first of all, we install uh, proof of concept and some additional uh, proof of concept script and some additional dependencies on the attacker. In the same uh, time, we open the victim machine. Uh, we will install uh, curl there to emulate some web requests. Yeah, it's the console of the victim machine. And um, after the installation of the core, the idea that we try to get the data from the uh, google.com. After that, we start the attack and try to use own uh, web server instead of the google.com. So now you see the usual, the valid uh, response from the uh, google.com. And this is the attacker pod. We run uh, the NES spoofing uh, proof of concept that uh, I found in that uh, uh, blog post. I also uh, uh, improved it to use uh, it on Azure. Uh, by default, it did not uh, support it. Uh, and we start the attack here. And now we do the same uh, request. And you can see that our web server uh, responds it instead of the uh, google.com. So it's a classic DNS, uh, ARP DNS spoofing that we demonstrated in this demo. And I updated the report to demonstrate this attack. Elastic changed the report. Uh, and a few days, uh, one week ago, 
uh, they rewarded uh, with uh, almost 4,000 bounties for this attack. Uh, not bad for unexploitable case and very exotic attack. Uh, um, and it was very interesting experience to try to uh, use ARP spoofing in the real bug bounty case. So, uh, I omit uh, a lot of the details of network configuration of the uh, Kubernetes, if you're interested in uh, that, or read the blog post, uh, I'm sure you enjoy it. It's uh, one of the best blog posts about Kubernetes network networking that I was read. The links, uh, all links will be in the end of the presentation. Let's see on another uh, attacks. Uh, the main topic in my PhD studies uh, for last two years was uh, server-side prototype pollution vulnerabilities. We published three papers about that when we found uh, we implemented some tool chain to find prototype pollution vulnerabilities. We found prototype pollution uh, gadgets that allows us to uh, exploit prototype pollution and achieve a remote code execution attack in Node.js uh, itself, in Dino, in uh, NPM packages. If you're interested in this, uh, read the papers. And I also give us some short introduction of our research and uh, prototype pollution attack the last year on DevCon and uh, many technical details of the gadgets that we found in Node.js itself in another talk on the Black Hat Asia. Uh, and today I will uh, tell you short introduction what the prototype pollution is, uh, just to uh, be on the same page. So let's assume that we have a Node.js application. Uh, we run some web server. You see index.js. It's very simple web server that can handle two requests update and backup. Uh, for update request, we provide some arguments. For backup request, we just trigger the backup of database. OK, it's all set up. So we have attacker in this threat model. It's any user that can send any request uh, to the web server. And if the attacker send such request with these parameters, uh, and we have a handler for update request, the handler in the first line create empty object and uh, runtime in the same time create empty object with the built-in property proto that points to the object prototype that contains a lot of function like to string uh, value of that we can reuse so it's like inheritance implementation uh, for javascript and TypeScript. Uh, in the second line, you can see that we read the property from the object uh, that specified in the argument org. This is the proto. It means we get a reference to this object. In the last line of the code, we assign a value from details to another property of the prototype, that property shell. So we read the proto, we assign a value calc in the shell, and we get it in the prototype. This code pattern uh, is called prototype pollution, because we pollute, we add some proper property or replace some property in the object prototypes itself. Let's assume that we have such code for backup handler. This function try to run uh, the backup script, this one, and use the shell from the options and default shell if the uh, shell is undefined. In our case, shell is undefined and it will be used the default shell. Okay, it's very common pattern in the JavaScript. But what actually happens if we trigger this handler after uh, prototype pollution? Uh, we create options that points to the same object prototype. We read the shell and the runtime lookups for the shell property 
in the prototype chain and treats the polluted shell property. And the exact command run a calculator because we get a calc in the shell uh, in the CMD variable in the end. Okay, this is prototype pollution and uh, remote code execution that we can uh, achieve by prototype pollution in the end. And this code pattern is called a uh, gadget, prototype pollution gadget. Let's uh, start the story too about prototype pollution and remote code execution uh, based on that. So, I try to use uh, Silent Spring. It's uh, our first research on the prototype pollution, the toolchain that we implemented uh, based on the code QL to uh, detect prototype pollution vulnerabilities in Kibana. So the first uh, attempt uh, code QL terminated by timeout uh, because of too large uh, database that I tried to analyze. I implemented a script that rerun code QL for subfolders uh, if the analysis is timed out. And this script reported 77 cases uh, in the application itself. I will add the, the script in the same repository if you're interested. You can find it there and also try to play with that. So, uh, we get 44 uh, server-side cases, including uh, some false positive testing code. And today I will uh, show you a couple, uh, a couple cases from this uh, that was exploited. So, uh, the first case, this is prototype pollution uh, pattern that was detected in the config parser. The config parser uh, take um, some YAML document, uh, main config of the Kibana, when you restart Kibana, and uh, after the parsing, it also try to uh, expand dot separated names in the, this YAML uh, config to uh, such nested object. So, A dot B becomes A object that contains nested object with property B. So, very simple uh, idea. But the code that does it is vulnerable to prototype pollution. First of all, it take a key, like A, B in our case, split it by the dot, so we get array A and B, and call uh, walk uh, function. In the walk function, we uh, get the first key a and read the value of the a and uh, call walk recursively. So, okay. And for the next uh, case, if we have a last case, very the B case becomes uh, empty array now, and we assign the value to the B. So it's uh, absolutely the same pattern that I shown you before in the prototype pollution, and such payload leads to prototype pollution vulnerabilities in this case. So we can add any property and we control uh, the value of the polluted property. Good. I found it and uh, uh, also Elastic Cloud Enterprise, it's an on-premise uh, version of the Ilka uh, stack, I provide web UI to edit Kibana YAML. It means we can uh, edit it with admin privileges, so it's uh, we need some high-level privileges, but we can do this attack through the web. Uh, attacker can store any payload in Kibana and uh, restart Kibana to load all configs. The problem here that Kibana crashes immediately after prototype pollution occurs uh, because other code does not uh, expect some properties, some additional properties in the object prototypes. Uh, it happens. <coughs> Sorry, it happened before 
we uh, get started web server. We cannot send any other request to trigger uh, to trigger any um, gadget. It means we can only control the uh, prototype pollution point. Uh, and it's some um, difficulty with that because nothing dangerous happened between restarting Kibana and prototype pollution triggering and uh, the crash of the application. So it just tried to load some modules, try to uh, load configs, uh, prepare some caches, and nothing dangerous like starting new process or uh, evaluate some function. And the attack looks like unexploitable. Uh, so you can achieve denial of the service, but if you are administrator and you restart uh, Kibana, it's nothing actually. What we can do in this case? Let's see what Kibana did uh, before the crash. It tried to load some modules. It would be nice if we have a gadget in the require call that loads modules. Because the require uh, evaluate the code that it loads up from the model. And if we can replace the model to the own code, we can get remote code execution before the crash. That's a nice idea. And we already um, found the gadget uh, in the requirement worked on the first paper, Silent Spring, that I mentioned today. Uh, and yeah, actually we can um, uh, run any malicious JS file uh, through the prototype pollution. Let's see, let's see on the um, uh, required gadget how it works. So let's assume that we have the same prototype pollution uh, uh, from the first example, and uh, we can trigger and pollute some property main in the object prototype. Oh, yeah, we, we can pollute one more uh, one more uh, property environment and trigger or uh, uh, handle backup. Handle backup has only one line, a require to the sum model. And when require try to uh, load the model bytes, it has such code. It do load config and uh, for load config, uh, it this function returns the parsed JSON like this one with all properties from the config. But some uh, package JSON and the configuration file does not have uh, main. In this case, the default behavior should be get index.js, uh, but we have main read uh, expression here, and it try to read the main that we polluted before from the object prototype. It means we can uh, read any uh, JS file that exists in the system. And we, uh, it's some limitation for the required gadget, but we combine it with another attack. If we can find some JS file that, for, uh, for example, start new process, do child process exec, we can combine it with another function. And npm JS actually, uh, when we load it, uh, starts new process. Uh, it does, uh, Mm, such code, it executes spawn function uh, with two arguments, uh, node, uh, the executable process, and some arguments. And the implementation on the spawn gadget, we have another gadget, the spawn function, sorry, we have another gadget. Uh, let's try to read property shell and env from the options. And options was empty. Uh, undefined, it means it becomes an empty object. And when we read env here, we read it from the empty object. And we actually read the value from the prototype. Okay, that's the idea of the require gadget. The problem that this gadget 
has been fixed by Node.js team. And I already knew this uh, when found it. And in parallel, I worked on the, some another tool, some dynamic analysis that's called G Hunter that described it in the last uh, paper that we published it and that will be presented in Usenix security in few days next week. Uh, and uh, working on that tool, I investigated uh, um, Require Gadget and the fix. Uh, and the Require Gadget looks like this. So it, the code that we already saw, we have a load config. So we have uh, such code that uh, read package JSON, try to parse it by JSON parse and JSON parse a return object that has a object prototype in the own chain. And it tried to read the main property. And at that moment, it can read the polluted property if we already polluted main in the object prototype. So this is a gadget and Node.js team fixed it. So the fix looks like this. They wrote some filter on properties that actually read this list of properties exactly from the object itself, does not check it in the prototype chain. So it means we cannot affect a reading on the main property anymore after that fix. But at some moment, G-Hunter start detect uh, the required gadget again in the new version of the Node.js. And I double checked all experiments and I see that required detected again and again for some cases. And I start to see on these fix more closely. And it has another gadget. I will zoom in. You can see exactly in these slides. We have this if statement, if JSON is undefined, the function returns false. The function load config returns false. Parse JSON becomes a false and we try to read the main from the false. JS runtime in this case try to box primitive type, boolean type, and add object prototype in the prototype chain. And we again can read the main, but from the false, actually. <laughs> so it's new gadget. And when I figure out it, um, so I um, add uh, the payload for the Rikwari in the uh, original uh, Kibana YAML file, and uh, it allows us to exploit uh, with this prototype pollution and uh, achieve remote code execution. So this uh, vulnerability did not get a high score because uh, it required high privileged uh, user, but still it's uh, almost 4,000 bounces. Let's see on the next story about prototype pollution and remote code execution. Another case that was reported by our script, Silent, uh, Silent Spring uh, Node.js queries, was a prototype pollution in uh, some handler, web handler. So it's very simple prototype pollution. You can see we create empty object, it means this object has the prototype uh, points to the object prototype. And we have this uh, line of the code, if namespace is uh, underscore underscore prot underscore underscore, and the key is the key uh, controlled by the attacker, that's so. And the value also can be uh, controlled by the attacker. It means we can add any key with controlled value to the object prototype. Very simple, you don't even need to uh, script to find it. Um, okay, so when we, I started working on this script, the question, we need to find a gadget. We worked on the Dusty, it's another project that detected uh, 49 uh, gadget leading to remote code execution in um, 
NPM packages. We took uh, a thousand popular NPM packages and uh, run or dynamic analysis that try to instrument the package and investigate what the flows can lead to uh, read the properties from the prototype and can lead to remote code execution in the end. And one of the package that was uh, that has um, gadget was not mailer and Kibana use uses this gadget to send emails. So the idea, uh, we have uh, some uh, send mailer transport that's optional, but uh, you also can pollute some option to enable it. Um, and it has uh, some options that's by default uh, empty. Uh, and if uh, we have passed, in the options, the path of the run at pro, uh, program that should be sent mailer and arcs will be read from the uh, options object and prototype in our case and sent to the spawn function. Okay, so it means we can inject any command and execute, uh, uh, start any process on the uh, victim uh, machine. But the problem that delete handler crashed the application uh, in less than one second after the prototype pollution. So it's also becomes uh, immediately because some code in the end of the handler of the same handler does not expect the property, some additional property and throw exception that's uh, not handled correctly. And we get denial of the service. That's not much interesting for such uh, uh, vulnerability. So it looks like unexploitable denial of the service. Uh, I could not say that it's an uh, interesting impact that we want to show. But if we try to emulate some race condition by sending a lot of gadget triggered requests in parallel and one prototype pollution triggered request between them, we can try to get uh, the situation that uh, gadget triggered request will be in the small uh, time exactly after the prototype pollution request. Uh, let me explain it uh, based on the script, on the exploit script. Uh, so we can implement such race condition exploit uh, on the bash or any other language. So the idea, uh, we send 20 requests that trigger a gadget first, and after that, we send the request that trigger a prototype pollution. And after that, we send uh, 50 requests that trigger a gadget again. And this uh, ampersand means that all of these commands, commands will be executed in parallel. So we send a lot request. Let's see how it works uh, in the demo. So I run it from the my laptop uh, through the Wi-Fi uh, and um, first of all, I start some payload that uh, created uh, email uh, connector that we need to know to send the request to trigger uh, node mailer package. So we uh, change uh, in this part, in or exploit uh, sh script this connector <clears throat> and run the exploit script. And I um, started uh, this web page to see which request we will get. So I did not run a reverse shell, I just sent a request to the uh, to this web page. You can see that five requests will be successfully uh, received. It means that five cases will be for uh, so short time that's uh, that were exe executed before the crash. So, and uh, this attack was run it from the Wi-Fi. You can get more interesting, I guess, if you run it on the same server in the same network, uh, like in cloud or some places. Okay. Uh, this attack uh, gave me uh, biggest bounty that I uh, got from the Elastic. 
And uh, not only this prototype pollution that I reported was exploited, uh, this case was closed a few days ago. I did not have time to add it in the presentation and also we don't have much time. Uh, and uh, another case uh, that was reported also, this is a chain that leads to account uh, takeover. Uh, maybe I will do it in the next uh, presentation, let's see. Uh, as a bonus part, I want to explain um, the uh, some advanced technique um, for the prototype pollution when we pollute the objects in the prototype, not the prototype itself. Uh, it when I uh, understand understood this trick, it allows me to report few new vulnerabilities that I actually thought unexploitable before. Let's see on the example. We have a prototype pollution uh, from our orig original example, very simple code that we already know. We have a gadget. The gadget uh, read uh, options and check the property runner. So the options um, empty object by default. So, and if the runner is defined, we read pass and args and spawn a new process for that. So it means we need to pollute a runner in the object prototype, so like this. Uh, so we add a runner with this object as a value. Okay, but and after that we trigger a handle backup, of course, to trigger a gadget. What if this uh, prototype pollution does not allow us to uh, control the value? For example, it's some object with predefined identificator on another properties. We cannot control it as attack. Or it's empty array. Array does not have any properties, right? So uh, it looks like unexploitable at least for such gadget. Maximum we can get denial of the service, but so. But what if we have a such code? Uh, it's a fixed, I call it a fixed prototype pollution. We check that uh, org does not equal a prota and execute this uh, code only for that. It cannot lead to prototype pollution, but we can uh, combine these two code snippets. So it's absolutely uh, safe code separately from this one, but what we can do together with these components. First of all, we need to pollute the prototype via the runner with the value of empty array in the prototype to trigger handle uh, update. Good. Uh, after that, we trigger this safe function to with org uh, that has a runner value. It means we will try to read the runner from the prototype at this step. And we pollute the runner after that. We can fill any additional uh, properties in the runner by this call and the second call. And after that, we trigger backup uh, handler. It gives us the remote code execution again by this chain of the calls, the web request that triggers such functions. If you think that it's unlikely that we find some fixed prototype pollution case and some fixed prototype pollution case in the same uh, application, I can say you that, for example, merge functions are very typical uh, in the um, fixed prototype pollutions, like a merge function of the very popular uh, package Lodash allows us to uh, pollute a runner with such payload. And you can find Lodash merge calls in many applications. And that's important that these two parts can be unrelated. It could be absolutely different features in, uh, uh, in the application. So yeah, use it for fun and bounces. 
In conclusion, in this talk, uh, I wanted to show the cases that look unexploitable and say, don't give up. Try to achieve remote code execution, even it looks uh, impossible. Uh, if you're interested in prototype pollution research, check out our papers, uh, Silent Spring, G Hunter, and Dusty that I mentioned uh, in the talk. Uh, check out the collection of uh, server-side prototype pollution gadget that we shared. This is a gadget in Node.js itself and Dino and NPM packages that I also use in my uh, bug bounty um, cases. Uh, if you're interested in uh, uh, networking attacks uh, and this story about ARP spoofing, I highly recommend to read this blog post. Uh, ARP spoofing in Kubernetes is not so easy as it looks like. Uh, it also has uh, some uh, difficulties with uh, uh, IP table rules that was bypassed by this talk. Uh, check out this uh, blog post. Uh, you, I think you enjoy it. And uh, follow me in the Twitter if you're interested in the, some details of uh, code reuse attacks. I want to share some findings that I am now including in my thesis. Uh, and uh, thank you for your attention. Um, enjoy DEFCON. Bye-bye.